Hi, I'm Patrick Phelps. Welcome back to Mining Matters. Uh, today I'm on an old forestry site. Why? Well, about a week or so ago the government declared a climate emergency, uh, as you may have seen if you pay any attention to the news in New Zealand. Uh, at the forefront of the government's plans to combat climate change, really, uh, the idea of getting people to stop burning coal uh, and to start burning sort of wood waste and this sort of stuff instead or you know to be fair some bigger branches and things like that to be had now what the climate emergency being declared is actually going to mean for the long-term survival of I don't know polar bears or the ability of coastal properties to get insurance I would hate to speculate as some people may know, the biggest users of coal in New Zealand are the likes of dairy processors, um, the meat industry, people growing vegetables out of season in hothouses, tomatoes, capsicums, that sort of thing. Um, to a far lesser extent, keeping schools and hospitals and universities warm in, in the winter. And then the other big ones, I guess, are your, uh, your steel production or manufacturing within New Zealand, cement production, electricity generation at Genesis Energy's Huntley Power Plant, Shit, for a country that actually only gets about 7% of its primary energy supply from coal, we, we still use it for quite a lot of stuff. Given one of the government's bright ideas is to be burning this stuff instead of coal and natural gas, it, it's worth looking at. Now the logic that underpins this decision is really best summed up by our current climate change minister, who said in July last year that New Zealand's got wood. We've obviously got lots of wood lying around and the problems that we had in Tolaga Bay with all of that waste wood that ended up washing through the river and down onto the beach, you know, you can imagine that would have been much better used as a source of energy if we'd had the supply chain set up for that. There's a long list of reasons why it's difficult to swap out coal for biomass in our boilers and gas for that matter as well, uh, but it's just that one particular uh, statement of Mr Shaw's that I'd like to look at today. We've obviously got lots of wood lying around. Despite what James Shaw says, we've actually got relatively little wood lying around and we're going to have less and less as we get closer to 2050 by which stage we're hoping to be carbon neutral. New Zealand last year went through about 63 petajoules of, of coal and about 84.5 petajoules of natural gas so up towards 150 uh, petajoules of energy derived from both coal and natural gas together. Scion, Skyon, however they're pronounced, are a crown funded forestry industry research group. Now according to their estimates we're going to reach peak biomass availability that's the sum total of all the um, wood and plant residual matter that's, that's lying around not being used that is going to peak in 2022 and it's going to trend downwards from there out to 2050 as far as I can see. 2022 when we reach what I'm just going to refer to from now on as peak wood even though it includes other plant matter peak woods just got a certain uh, ring to it um, at peak wood in 2022 we're going to have gross residual biomass that's unutilized plant matter with potential energy value of about 45 petajoules so still a long way short of the 63 petajoules of coal that we went through this year and a, and a far longer way short of the 84 and a half um, petajoules of uh, natural gas on top of that but like I say peak um, availability of gross um, residual biomass 45 petajoules by 2022 um, the, the more favorable or optimistic if you like recovery rates for that say that about 27 petajoules would be more um, would be recoverable economically um, the more conservative figures which as far as I can tell are still quite optimistic say that 2020 or 22 um, petajoules would be recoverable or, or, or thereabouts and that's really because the majority of that biomass is available in areas where there's not um, demand that it, that, can, that it can really meet and the majority of the demand for the biomass isn't where the trees are and it's not generally economic to cart wood which is very energy diffuse i.e. takes up a lot of space relative to the amount of energy that it provides it's not generally economic to cart at long distances. Now the regional side of things is fairly important and I'll get to that um, quite shortly but the reason that there's such a bumper supply for the next few years is because there was a boom of planting in the 1990s, what people quite often refer to as the wall of wood. And that's the time when my family, um, I think it was late 80s, early 90s, um, that this ground got planted with 
pine trees, but it's all been harvested now. Planting peaked at 98,000 new hectares um, being planted in 1994, and then it sort of edged downwards from that into the 2000s when new planting rates got to as low as 2,000 hectares a year, and they really stayed there, and we never really got our wood back up again. Now, the average age for a Pinus radiata to be harvested is about 28 years old, so even if, you remember this guy? <laughs> Even if we managed to plant a billion trees this year right now, we wouldn't see the harvesting of those economically um, for about another 28 years. Because its main focus is it's not planted as an energy resource, it's planted for timber, and any wood residue that we can get from that is only going to be a byproduct. From, from 2022 onwards, in terms of this stuff that's just left around at skid sites and that sort of thing, that's edging downwards out to 2035, and on that more conservative recovery rate, it's estimated there's only going to be 15 petajoules of recoverable biomass by the 2030s. Again, that's in the context of the current close to 150 petajoules of energy um, demand that we have for coal and natural gas. Now even assuming those 15 petajoules are economically recoverable, and even assuming that biomass like wood waste, agricultural waste, um, could actually do the job that coal and gas is currently doing now, that's only going to make up a quarter of the current demand for coal, and only about 10% of the current demand for coal and natural gas. Now, that's just at a national level. The majority of the wood waste in the country is concentrated in the likes of the Bay of Plenty, and then to a lesser extent, East Coast, Northland, those sorts of areas. That's all your forestry offcuts, like you get on skid sites, or possibly wood waste from sawmills and things like that. Um, but a fair chunk of it too is also agricultural waste from Canterbury. So we're talking maize and corn husks and stalks and leaves and things like that and I'm not an engineer and I don't run a boiler but I'd be keen to talk to any boilerman or boiler woman if you like and um, and see whether they think that you could actually run a boiler on that because you can barely even do it on wood let alone that stuff. Now, as I've said it's not really economic to cart biomass uh, long distances so it's also not economic to cart it from places that have got a large supply of biomass without a lot of demand for energy to places that have a lot of demand for energy but not a lot of biomass available. Despite all this the government's pushing on with the 70 million dollar fund through the Energy Efficiency Conservation Authority, ECA, whatever they're called. Um, they're pushing on with a 70 million dollar fund to try and help people who are currently using coal and gas switch to cleaner alternatives like electricity or, or wood waste. Now electricity is a story for another day but the government has been repeatedly told by coal users um, that there's just not enough wood. Now most coal users who I've spoken to would gladly stop using coal and use something else in the same way that most of us who drive a, a car that runs on a four-stroke combustion engine would gladly switch to an electric vehicle if it were cheap enough to buy one, if you could go far enough on a single charge and if they didn't take very long to recharge. Most people in New Zealand who use coal don't like to admit it. They're their coal boilers are seen as an embarrassment. Now, I personally think they need to grow some backbone and stick up for themselves, but of course I would say that. But all of that aside, it's, it's not a love of coal or fossil fuel emissions or, or, or coal miners um, that keeps the coal boilers big and small continuing to use um, coal to generate their process heat. It purely comes down to economic survival. If they had something else, they'd almost certainly be using something else. Purely looking at a supply side of things, um, when the person whose job it is, I should remind you, to know everything there possibly is to know about climate change in New Zealand, when that person can make a, a flippant statement like this. We've obviously got lots of wood lying around. When someone can make that statement, when it's obviously quite questionable, you kind of have to wonder, how do they approach all the other issues they deal with and what else do they get wrong? Anyway, thanks for watching.